Anyway, it's great to be here and great to take uh, a little bit of time and, uh, and uh, get to know everybody a little bit better and tell you a little bit about what's going on in our races. Uh, and uh, this Senate race also uh, is one that's going to get a little bit of attention here over the next four, four and a half months, but uh, that's the way I want it. Um, you know, one of the things that I did as I was, since you mentioned uh, going to school at USC, the way I got myself to college, uh, I argued back uh, in Nevada that I was the poorest kid ever to attend the University of Southern California. My father was an auto mechanic, and he had six kids, so he clearly wasn't going to be able to afford some of that uh, tuition, and uh, my mother was a, was a school cook, um, so we didn't have a lot of money, and, and uh, but I still wanted to go to the University of Southern California. What I did is I started working on the floor of the Pacific Stock Exchange. And by working on the floor of the Pacific Stock Exchange, I'd start at 6.30 in the morning and, and work till 1.30 in the afternoon and then take classes in the afternoon. So that was the only way I was gonna make myself through school, but it certainly uh, certainly was helpful. The reason I tell you this is, first ad, of course, that my opponent um, ran against me was that I'm a bad stockbroker. <laughs> I've been a bad stockbroker since the 80s. Um, I'm a big bad stockbroker, and I guess I'm, I'm pro banks or something of that nature. Uh, obviously, she doesn't explain the fact that she voted for the bailout to actually bail these people out, uh, which I voted against. But uh, the good part about this race, the good part about this race is my opponent's wrong on everything. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a great place to start. She's literally wrong on everything. Taxes, sizing government, regulations, bailouts, stimulus, uh, cash for clunkers, uh, Obamacare, you name it. She voted for all those. In fact, uh, uh, Americans for Prosperity have a door hanger now in, uh, uh, in, in Nevada. It's six and a half feet long. That's the size of the door hanger, six and a half feet long. And it compares her with Obama. Everything that they voted for together, six and a half feet long. Tell me that doesn't get people's attention. So it's all good news. It's all good news. And uh, fortunately, uh, this campaign is moving uh, in the right direction. I want to thank everybody for taking time, and I know we have questions that you want to, to have answered, so I, I'm willing to do that. So why don't I, uh, let's get through the introductions. Uh, we'll go with uh, Jeff here, and then uh, we'll go get to your questions right away. All right, thanks. I'm Jeff Blake. I've met many of you before, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm running for the seat being vacated by John Kyle, as you know. John Kyle served, I think, the country, and certainly the state of Arizona well, and he leaves big shoes to fill. Uh, in this race, uh, there is still, we have a late, late primary, uh, August 28th. And we love to campaign in August in Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, there are uh, three other Republicans in that race. Uh, we, we're doing pretty well there. The, the general is going to be tough. We've got uh, a guy named Rich, Richard Carmona. If the name rings a bell, uh, he was President Bush's Surgeon General to 2002 to 2006. Uh, he was a registered independent until November. Now he's a registered Democrat. Um, I think he's gone full circle. He's gone from being the independent-minded Democrat to uh, two days ago he had an event with Al Franken in Arizona. So that, uh, that's kind of tough to run the uh, independent route. There was another Democrat in the race. Uh, he was in long enough before he dropped out to pull Richard Carmona out on some of the issues. Most importantly, Obamacare. Uh, Obamacare is a heavy anchor to drag around the state of Arizona. Obviously, we have the budget issues. If Obamacare is implemented as it is planned in 2014, that will mean a $1 billion budget hit to the state of Arizona in the first year, just in the number of people who will have to come back on the rolls. So there's resistance to that. And then also, obviously, in the retirement communities, people are concerned about the kind of care uh, they're going to get or not going to get uh, with Obamacare. And so that's, that's a tough uh, thing to be for. He likes to say, my opponent, uh, that... Uh, um, he says that I, every other sentence, putting on my Surgeon General's hat, or when I was Surgeon General, or as the nation's doctor, and uh, it gets a little annoying, but, uh, <laughs> but I think in particular in, in Arizona right now, uh, people want access to their own doctor. They don't want the nation's doctor. And that kind of reinforces this notion that we have to have one size fits all program like Obamacare. So we feel good about where we are. Obviously, uh, my record is, is far on the other side on, on fiscal issues. I think uh, I'm where Arizonans are, kind of in the mold of uh, uh, independent-minded conservatives that have been there before. So I appreciate the help that uh, many in this room have given and, uh, and that you all, I hope, will give. So thank you and look forward to answering any questions. 
Well, thank these guys for whipping you all into a frenzy for me. <laughs> go, Danny, go! Yeah, go, Danny, go! All right, trivia question. Uh, Jim and I went to high school 140 miles apart. Who's older, he or I? <laughs> he is. By one year. Jim, thanks for the invitation. The only reason Denny brought it up. Yeah, I wouldn't have otherwise. Well, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. We used to tell North Dakota jokes, and uh, uh, General Custer was going through North Dakota, and he said, act dumb until I get back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll slow down so you guys can get there. The, the jokes on us, they're all rich over in the pocket formation, and, and, uh, so we can't tell North Dakota jokes anymore. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, our race started much sooner than even uh, Dean's. Dean was still a congressman when I announced for the United States Senate, and uh, that was a year ago last February. And we've been engaged in a full body contact since that time. I'm on the air full time, he's on the air. I won't go down until November. We'll be on. TV, um, the Americans for Prosperity started an ad today against Tester. Democrat Senatorial Committee began an ad against me today. We've literally bought all the time from now until November. The good news is it only costs $130,000 a week in Montana. <laughs> Everybody always asks me the question, uh, you know, how's, how, what are the issues in Montana and how's unemployment? Well, the issues are the same in Montana as everywhere. We're not uh, unique in that we, we also get Kennedy and Limbaugh and Fox News and such. So the, the issues are things like the economy and jobs. Uh, when it comes to unemployment, Montana, it spans the distance of Washington, D.C. to Chicago. That's how far across the state is. So we have anywhere from 3% uh, unemployment next to North Dakota, which is the pocket formation. And we have 15% up in the areas where the federal government has a lot of property, which is essentially what we're going to talk about in this campaign. It's two different visions and, frankly, two different ways to represent the same state. I just happen to believe the government isn't the solution. He thinks the government is the solution. We had our first debate this last week at the Montana Newspaper Association Convention, and uh, he's not backing down his support of the president's health care reform that didn't reform health care, of course, and he doesn't back down from his support for a failed stimulus and the cap and trade. He, uh, he feels comfortable in being able to try and defend that position, which you would find shocking, but I am the only Republican elected statewide in the state of Montana. Uh, the rest are all Democrats. And people say, well, how can that be? You live next to Wyoming and, and Idaho. Well, it's easy. Uh, when you look at the kind of representation we have in Montana with environmentalists, trial lawyers, union number one was an underground copper miners of Butte, Montana, which used to be referred to as the richest hill on earth. But think about this for a minute. Who is the president's campaign manager? Jim Messina from Montana. Who is the number one Democrat pollster? Solinda Lake from Montana. Um, I go on down the list. Who's the head of NARAL? Anybody know who the head of NARAL is? Someone from Montana. Nancy Keenan, who was my first opponent in 2000. Who's the head of Anglo's list? Really? Stephanie Schrock, John Tester's first campaign, uh, the first uh, chief of staff. So we have a lot of ideologues coming out of Montana with a liberal bent, and that's what I'm up against in this campaign. It's going to be probably, if you can imagine, a 30 to $40 million race just in Montana alone. We have 140,000 undecided voters. We're going to buy each one of them a house. <laughs> By the time we're done with this race. But our issues are the same issues as everywhere else. Uh, where are we going to be on November as far as the economy? And I talk about real jobs and a real economy. Real jobs are created not by government, but by small business and the people that are sitting in this audience and the people that you represent. So it's going to be a clear contrast of philosophies between Max, uh, Max, <laughs> Randy is him once too, that was fun. Um, <laughs> between John Tester and myself, a clear contrast. Do you more closely associate with somebody who thinks that the government is the solution that you can buy your way into prosperity? Let me real, touch on something else real quick. As the chairman of Appropriations Subcommittee on Labor, Health and Human Services, Education, everybody asks me, what's the Supreme Court going to do? I have no idea. Uh, but it's going to be fairly disruptive to our budget as we put it together. We were originally going to go to markup um, Christine, what day? Thursday. Uh, tomorrow, we're not. Um, it's probably safer to, to wait just a little bit and find out you know, what the court's going to do. If any of you have any insight, uh, if you annoy me with the justice per personally, just whisper in my ear. I promise I won't tell anybody. Just let me know what they're, uh, what they're thinking. But 
we're paying attention to that because they still have to put a budget together, um, an appropriations bill. So we'll be watching that with some interest. I hope they throw the whole thing out. It would be a lot easier for me as the chairman of that committee, but I don't know if they're going to do that. So again, thank you for being here, allowing me the opportunity to answer your questions later on. And now, no further ado, the guy that's probably most likely to win an open seat, Rick Bird. <laughs> I let him make fun of North Dakota as long as he's so nice to me. <laughs> I tell you, I, uh, Jim, thanks for uh, having us here. I, uh, I want to say that, that uh, several weeks ago we had a big debate in the House gym over whether it's the ribbon or the rip-on, and whether it was the White Oak in Michigan where the Republicans first started, or whether it was Ripon, Wisconsin, where it first started. And so I was in between Paul Ryan and Dave Camp and Bill Antingham. And I just want you to know that I put my stake in the ground two weeks ago. It's ripping. It's ripping. <laughs> so what your organization does here is great. And I think, uh, I mean, it's a great theme. This is a great theme. And I love the, uh, love the tapes. Uh, what, what we've got in North Dakota, of course, our race is pretty simple. Uh, from my perspective, it's whether or not you want someone who's going to support the president and his policies or whether you want someone who's going to fight against his policies. The seat I'm running for uh, has been in Democrat hands for 52 years. So Ken Conrad for 26 years and before him Byron Dorgan, or excuse me, uh, Quentin Burdick for 26 years. Uh, Byron Dorgan, of course, uh, resigned two years ago or did not run for re-election. And so North Dakota is changing. And the reason it's changing is the Bakken formation. The reason it's changing is because 10 years ago, uh, we were in a deficit like every other state, and what we did is we said, you know what? We're gonna encourage the private sector, we're gonna take government and make it stable. So stable regulation, stable taxation, and we're gonna encourage the private sector. I mean, it sounds simple, but that's what works. Uh, in North Dakota, if you wanna know what your taxes are today, they're probably not gonna change 10 years from now. And that's what we see out in Washington right now is all this instability. This instability of, uh, you know, those of us that are dealing with the budget, dealing with taxes, everything's kicked down in December. Uh, January 1, you know, if you die on January 1, your estate's going to be taxed 55% and everything over a million dollars. All this uncertainty is what stalled America. And so in, in our race, uh, that's really uh, what the issue is going to be. Uh, as was said earlier, um, we're right on the issues. And I think what's happening, what's happening in this election, if you look towards the western states, I mean, we understand these things. You can't spend more than you make long term. You don't rely on the government <coughs> to take you or bail you out. What you do is you look for opportunities. And so I'm actually very fired up to be part of this group. I think, uh, you know, these four people, these three people and myself, these states, uh, with your support and the support of so many of you of what you've done, are going to be the new majority in the Senate. And what we're going to end up doing, quite frankly, is we're going to make Washington live by those values that we all grew up with and we know work. And, you know, we're going to quit living by the mistakes that Washington's making. So I couldn't be more excited to uh, be in this campaign. Appreciate all your help. And uh, uh, it's going to be a fun run. So thank you, Jim. Thank you. You know, I don't know, and, I, and frankly, I don't care. What you don't have, though, is let's say they do strike it down. You do not have a 2,700-page replacement from the Republican Party out there. That's the good news. We don't have a 2,700-page replacement for it. If they strike down portions of it, I see eventually repealing all of it, but looking for issues that we can bring back. There are some good portions and parts of uh, that particular piece of legislation that I think ought to stay, and I think most Republicans agree with that. But the mandate obviously has to go. Um, the uh, IPAP has to go. Those are issues that have to go. Those were bad. Um, uh, those were issues that I think were bad for all Americans. I'm hoping that that's what the Supreme Court, uh, frankly, uh, um, uh, takes a look at. Uh, obviously, I wouldn't have a problem if they struck the whole thing down. But if they take portions, I think IPAP and the uh, mandate are the two things that have to go. I would think eventually, um, at least on our side, of, uh, of the Capitol building, we're looking at repealing the whole thing and then looking for reasonable things uh, to add back into it. But I think the most important thing for everybody here to understand is that Republicans do not have a 2700 page replacement for it. 
I think we can all make a case for both. Um, that uh, if it goes down, then the president's <coughs> signature achievement um, from a former constitutional lawyer is ruled unconstitutional. So that's not a, not a mark on your record you want. And then if it is upheld, it certainly will motivate our voters to, to get out in November. We've debated it from every way you could possibly think of in, in the labor age. Uh, what, what I do want to point out to you is don't believe that just because if the mandate is found to be unconstitutional, that solves the problem, especially the funding problem, because there's no money attached to the mandate. That's how they're going to pay for it. But the problem is there are two things that are in the president's health care reform uh, that you need to worry about. That's two new entitlements, and I try to talk about it around Montana. You know, when we're having a hard time paying for Medicare and Social Security, why would you create two new mandates that don't exist today? We can solve the whole sequestration issue uh, by just repealing those two mandates. What are they? Uh, one of them is called the uh, insurance premium subsidy. Uh, nobody's on it right now. The other is the expansion of Medicaid. Nobody is on it right now. Why would you create two new entitlements at a time when you can't pay for the other two? What do those add up to? $1.4 trillion over the next 10 years. And so somebody needs to start jumping up and down and talking about the fact that we're missing the boat. It, unless they throw the whole thing out, they just created a, a, an entire mess for us because if, if the president is reelected and we cannot repeal Obamacare, we're going to be stuck with these two new entitlements and it's going to be very expensive. So I hope you'll all think a little bit about uh, getting involved in the, in the issue of elevating the fact that there are no, those two new entitlements because nobody's talking about that now. Well, I just hope for America this whole thing's thrown out. Uh, you know, personally, it's kind of like we've been fighting against Obamacare. I mean, that's what I ran against, that's what we're running against now. And so if it gets thrown out, you're like, well, gee, that's what we've been fighting against. Now what do we do? But, I mean, that's the right thing for America. And I think, as was said here, uh, uh, depending on what degree uh, their decision is, I think we still have a very strong case of do you want government controlling your health care, do you want government between the doctor and the patient, or do you want something else that's based on patient-driven, market-driven, uh, those types of issues that, that really are what it should be done. So, uh, personally, I'd like it overturned, thrown out 100%, and I think that would be good for us. President made his, I'm sorry. Uh, President made his pronouncement on immigration on Friday, providing a pathway for at least children of, of illegal immigrants to stay in this country for an additional two years if they go to university or if they're in the military forces. How is that issue being played out in your respective states? Yeah, it's a, it's probably very similar in Nevada as it is in Arizona, and uh, I haven't seen. Uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of noise on it yet, and I'm assuming that uh, we'll see some numbers pretty soon on, on how this is actually playing, but uh, I, I agree with Jeff, this is a short-term solution for a long-term problem, and we definitely have a long-term problem, and we have to figure out how we're gonna solve this. And when I work uh, with the, uh, the uh, Latin community, we have a lot more in common than we have that we disagree on. And right now, most of the Hispanic community is talking about the jobs or educating their kids, staying in their homes, um, uh, their business is going bankrupt. Uh, these are the issues in Nevada right now that are probably far exceeding, far exceeding um, than this particular piece of uh, this announcement by the president. And so we agree on so much more that I think right now uh, we're seeing some real positive effect on this. Uh, and so anyway, we'll see how this thing plays out, but uh, there is a long-term problem. And short-term solutions for political gain, I don't think is the answer. I wish I had an opponent like uh Mr. Heller, because in Montana, whether it's Max Bacchus or John Tester, they are not philosophically pure. They'll uh, blow with the winds of the uh, election cycle. And so Mr. Tester became a lot more modern over the course of the last couple of years with me in the race. I always say I'd make the senators better senators just because I'm running against them. They have to <laughs> try to represent the state of Montana. So to put it in perspective, John Tester voted against the Dream Act. Uh, thereby, of course, offending most of his liberal supporters, but they, they're willing to give him a pass on it. But I, I point out the fact that he voted against the Dream Act because Montana is one of those states that believe in borders security first. And it doesn't hurt us by taking that position. That is the right position. Uh, Al Simpson got himself a lot of trouble when he was the senator from Wyoming 
and back in the 80s pushed through the uh, original amnesty saying if you'll just give these guys amnesty we'll close the border we don't fall for that kind of thing anymore close the border first uh, make the effort and then we can talk about communism, immigration policy so I, i'm able to take a pretty tough line uh, my opponent is taking the same tough line well, in, in North Dakota, our main problem is the Montanians coming over. <laughs> <laughs> Josh. Uh, well, I, I, I think one of the interesting points here is I think the president and his campaign team is going to try and throw this campaign about everything but jobs, everything about the economy, every chance he gets. And, you know, clearly, uh, if we're talking about the economy, if we're talking about the long-term direction of our, our country and jobs, we'll win. We get caught in all these other issues. I think as a party, we'll lose, and so I think that's part of the strategy here. It's it's not a long-term solution. We need long-term solutions in so many areas, but it's a it's trying to get the debate on something else. You One last notice, question, anyone? Yeah. You notice Rick invited you and your children to all move to North Dakota. He's, he's in the rental housing business. <laughs> <laughs> Senator, go ahead. Uh, I would guess that all of your opponents are going to be acting like they're a lot more conservative on fiscal issues than they really are. I would just encourage you to uh, uh, tie them to the Democrat leadership. Uh, and, you know, you can ask them who you're going to vote for for leader, and they're going to vote for Harry Reid. You can say, you know, the Senate deserves an F. Uh, they haven't done a budget in three years. And, and tie your opponent, hey, they're going to support the leadership that hadn't even tried to do a budget. That's because. <coughs> And, and, and everybody realizes we can't have trillion dollar deficits, it's crazy. But the Democrats in the Senate, not the House, the House leadership's done budgets, and all of you can say, hey, we've, we've done our work, but the Senate hasn't. And your opponent's gonna be supporting leadership that hadn't done squat uh, in three years, and so I would really tie it to them. Uh, I wouldn't let them get away with that, because I think that's gonna be one of the big issues in this next election. I uh, stepped in the door and I talked to this real wise person, <coughs> Senator Nichols. And, and uh, he was asking me about the Keystone Pipeline. I said, well, my opponent. In fact, I got a call about two or three weeks ago from a buddy of mine. And he said, watch out for your opponent. She's trying to pass you on the right-hand side. Uh, she, that's, of course, illegal in North Dakota. Uh, she came out for Keystone, came out for a balanced budget. But, but the point is absolutely right. Last week, The Hill did an interview with her, and they said, who are you going to vote for for majority leader? And she said, well, I'm going to wait till after the election and make a decision. So this reporter called our office right away and said, you know, gee, here's what the, your opponent's saying. Do you have a comment? Well, we gave a comment. Then the reporter called back and said, well, you're going to be interested to know this. Within the hour, she called back and said, I misspoke. I will definitely be voting for Harry Reid for majority leader. <laughs> And I mean, your point is absolutely right. It's, it's we're gonna we got good people to some degree that we're running against. But the reason we haven't solved Keystone, the reason we haven't solved our spending these problems, is because they don't vote. Uh, they're not able to vote these issues. Nice to see you, Don. Good see you. Um, I, I was a campaign manager for Conrad Burns in 1988 when he beat uh, John Melcher. And Don Nichols, I'll always remember, you, you probably can visualize him on the Senate floor in grand debate. The only memory I have of you in 1988 is when you flew into Glendive, Montana, which is the nation's smallest TV market, and he expected us to load him in a car and take him down to the studio. He did not realize they don't have a studio. <laughs> and so he got out of the 310, Cessna 310, stood on the runway, and the photographer, the, the uh, broadcaster, had the camera and the mic and interviewed him, standing there all by himself with Conrad, just the two of them, and then got back in the plane and flew off. We won. We won. <laughs> we did. Uh, economics is, of course, the number one issue. I, anybody that thinks it's going to be something else is, is probably not paying attention. It's going to matter where the economy is on election day. Uh, John Tester made the mistake in the debate against Conrad to say, you know, our national debt is going to saddle each one of our men, women, and children with a $28,000 debt. Well, guess what? Six years later, that number is now $50,000. Uh, you can bet that clip from that uh, debate is going to end up in an ad somewhere. We are going to drive the contrast continually that you cannot go from the beginning of America's history to January 1 of 2007 and build an $8 trillion debt, and from January 1 of 2007 forward, almost double it. That a country cannot take. And the question becomes, 
what's the tipping point for the country? Is it 20 trillion, 25 trillion, 30? I don't want to find out. We cannot allow these people to continue down the path of believing that if they just spend a little bit more money, we're going to turn this thing around. And so it is the number one issue in my campaign, in our race, is the contrast of philosophies between their belief that government is the solution and our belief that small business is the solution. You know, ironically, with the, uh, the stimulus, if you wanted to spend a trillion dollars of borrowed money, it would have made more sense to uh, zero the payroll tax on employers and employees for one year, for every employer and employee in America, for one year, zero payroll tax, that would have cost a trillion dollars. And that would have helped the local florist, the chiropractor, the engineer. And I'm not suggesting that construction is not important. That was a great part of the stimulus. But the rest of the money went to pure spending. I, I, I'm having to live with the one-time expenditure of the stimulus money now being built into the budgets of the agencies I'm trying to deal with. I'll use Pell as an example, Pell Grants. $842 was added to each Pell Grant. Do you realize there are 9 million people getting Pell, half of which will never graduate? And up until last December when we changed the law, you could go to school for nine years. And you didn't have to have a high school diploma or a GED to get a Pell Grant. How crazy is that? And, and they took the money, they took $842, added it to the Pell. When I got to be chairman last January and tried to lower it by the $842 to the pre-stimulus level, you'd have thought I kicked every kid in America out of college. <laughs> uh, the, the schools had all built it into their tuition. So it's a spending problem. Another real quick number. Uh, it's called improper payments. I don't know if you know what that is. It's not waste, fraud, abuse. It, your, your grandmother dies. She gets $500 a month in Social Security. Two more checks come in after she passes away. What do you do? Most people just stick it in the estate. They pay for funeral services. I don't know what they do, but uh, you know what that adds up to? Improper payments in the nation per year? $124 billion in improper payments going out the door from the federal government. 10,000 people that are dead getting stimulus checks. Improper payments alone, $124 billion. So we have a spending problem in this country. Don't let them raise taxes until we get a handle on the budget. Don't don't support it. Don't, don't fall for the Simpson bowls. It sounds great, but once again, Al Simpson, you you know, you, 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 you kind of you fooled us on closing the borders by providing amnesty. And I, I say the same thing to Alan. I see him all the time. He, he shops in Billings because you know they don't have shopping centers in Northern Wyoming. They have to come to Montana. But until he's going to be in trouble when he runs for president. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, howdy. <laughs> Don't, don't fall for any kind of a compromise, that, you know, and the press especially wants to get us in, trapped in that kind of a debate. Why don't we ever hear compromise from you guys? Well, compromise has gotten us to where we are. Let's be tough for a little while. Let's try to control the spending first. Then we can talk about revenue someday. So it is going to be about the economy done. I mean, just say I use that all the time. The Senate not passing a budget. I always point out that uh, somebody mentioned a while ago the last time the Senate passed a budget, the iPad had not been invented. And that, now we're on the third generation of iPad, still no Senate budget. And the effect that it really has, aside from being unable to discipline your spending and prioritize, is the way you discipline the federal agencies is to go through regular order, through appropriation bill by appropriation bill, attached language, you know, a report language and amendments, hemming them in, saying you can't regulate this or you have to regulate that or this is what we meant when we passed that law. When we don't go through regular order, we don't get that. And when everyone knows, the agencies in particular know that we'll do one big omnibus bill at the end of the year, one vote, no amendments up or down, they know they can continue to run amok, and they are. And, and so the barriers to job growth are not just uncertainty on taxes, but I can tell you in Arizona, it's the certainty of regulation that is strangling everyone. And so that, that's an important point, and if we can tie our opponents to that and to the Senate, that'll be well for us. Senator, thanks for the question. In Nevada, we have highest unemployment in the nation. We have highest foreclosures. We have highest bankruptcy. And my opponent thinks the private sector is doing just fine. In fact, she believes the only way we get out of this is growth size government. Just like the president, she embraces uh, his economic policies. And they're obviously not working. And every group she says she is supporting and defending, students, women, um, seniors, middle class, you go down the list, uh, Hispanics, every one of them are just getting creamed, creamed by these policies. 
I'm a low tax, small government, reasonable regulation, free market capitalist, just like the founding fathers, and she's not. And so getting back to the budget, I agree, absolutely agree, three years. First, first ad, first ad out of the box is a piece of legislation that I introduced. No budget, no pay. The only way we're gonna convince members of Congress that it's important to budget is to actually take their pay away from them. And that is the first ad that I am running, is that piece of legislation that I've introduced. And it doesn't matter who you talk to in America. 85% of America will agree that if you don't do your job, you probably shouldn't be paid. And that's the problem with Washington, D.C. And that's the reason we have the economic problems we have in America today, is this lack of stability. It's because we refuse to budget. So that's my first, first ad that's out that started Sunday, is, is that legislation talking about we shouldn't be paid if we're not willing to do our jobs.